you, everybody. Good, Good morning. to see you all. Good Amen. Good morning, yeah. Those that are watching on the video, we thank everybody for being here today with us. It's an awesome, awesome blessing in the middle of the red hot summer that we're experiencing all over. I want to preach about something called partiality. Now, that's a word that doesn't dawn on you every day, I'm sure, because it certainly doesn't dawn on me. But yet, if you look, especially at the second chapter of the book of James, you find out that that word partiality is used a lot. And the Lord doesn't ever want us to use partiality. All right? And I got a definition for the word partiality if you don't know what it exactly it means. All right? But uh, this is tucked away in James chapter 2. And this word that I'm going to share with you this morning that James... Uh, J remember, James preached it first. I just get to, I just get to take his words and and uh, try to make a message out of them. Amen. As the Lord leads, and the Lord has told me to be uh, to just look at the book of James for the next couple of weeks. So that's what we're going to do. But chuck, tucked away in chapter two is this word partiality, and I believe this this word will lead us into understanding that uh, the church is in kind of a spirit today. Uh, and and it's, it's not a clean spirit, it's an unclean spirit. And we want the church broken out of this spirit. And there's a fancy word for it, it's called the antinomian spirit. And it's just, uh, all the antinomian spirit is, is a spirit that cheapens the actual grace of God. And we don't want any spirit to cheapen God's grace. We treasure God's grace. Amen. And we love God's grace. It was grace that saved me. I don't know about you. I believe you were saved by grace too. Amen? We were all great, saved by grace. And so God is countering this spirit today by bringing men into our lives like James, who was a man of prayer. The Bible said he had, not the Bible, but uh, certain books say that he had extra thick knees because he prayed a lot. Actually had calluses on his knees. Amen? And so I believe that's, that's from a lot of praying and a lot of pressing in. And so uh, we, we live in a day where grace is abused, grace is misunderstood. Uh, you, all you have to do is go to certain churches and in the lobby you might hear nice four-letter words right out in the lobby of the church. And when, if you ever confront anybody, you might get, hear this, well, I'm saved by grace. <laughs> well, grace didn't get to your mouth, that's for sure. Did I just say that? Amen. I guess I did. Okay. Uh, anyway... Uh, we're rounding, uh, we'll make this a horse race, okay? We're rounding the fourth turn. We're coming into the stretch. Uh, as far as the time clock goes, we're into timelines around here. If you notice, we got a real big one on the wall, and we love timelines. And the timeline shows right now through Scripture that we're in the last days. So you all know that. We're in the fourth, fourth turn coming into the home stretch. And so... There will be a tendency, we're so focused on that finish line, and we've got to finish, and we've got to finish, but there's some details that we have to uh, kind of concentrate on and focus on before we get to the finish line, and one of them is this word partiality, and God does not like partiality. I will tell you right now, after reading James chapter 2, I've come to that conclusion. Amen? And so, I want to give you a definition if I can. Actually, I'll give you two definitions, all right? And I won't charge you any extra for that second one, okay? It's on the house. All right? These are two men that I respect that lived a long, long time ago and actually died before I was born. One is, name is Thayer and another is Vines. And uh, these are both Greek, uh, Greek scholars that can define biblical words a lot better than I can. So I'm going to read the definition of partiality and why it might be so on God's heart for us not to be partial uh, towards people. Partiality is the fault of one who, when called on to give judgment, has respect of the outward circumstances of a man and not to their intrinsic merits, and so prefers as the more worthy the one who is rich, high-born or powerful to another who does not have those qualities. In other words, somebody that can you think can do something for you. Some, some are socially or whatever. And God says he doesn't like that. He likes us to be attentive to everybody. Here's the second definition. This is from Mr. Vines. 
It says, uh, partiality denotes respect of persons. Partiality. The fault of one who, when responsible to give judgment, has respect to the position, rank, popularity, or circumstances of men instead of their intrinsic conditions, preferring the rich and powerful to those who are not. The reason why these, these um, men use big words or why we have Dylan in the education system is to bring back some of these words like intrinsic and, and so forth and to get young minds to, to think a little bit harder and a little bit stronger. But it gets us to thinking too that we don't, we don't want to show partiality. And believe me, we are all prone to do that. Yeah. All right? Uh, right off the top of your head, if I said, you know, who do you, who do you think the, the nicest, cutest, wonderful, most magnificent person in the world is, besides Pastor Ed, um, <laughs> oh man, shameless self-promotion there, I'll tell you, that was terrible. Anyway, you see, you can think of somebody off the top of your head, but everybody should be, everybody should be your favorite. Everybody. Even if you don't like what they do, amen, you still should love them. They should be on your heart. And you, if, if they're not doing what you think they should be doing, you should be what? Praying for them, right? Interceding for them. There are a lot of people in, in, in this town that we would... Uh, would consider themselves our enemy. And believe me, we, we don't really consider them that way. We consider them as people that need the Lord. And so, ironically, we are all in the same boat, and we all drift to these conclusions, especially of partiality. And uh, we love people to love us, don't we? Amen? Sure. We love people to love us, and when they don't love us, then... We might hold some things back. And so, uh, partiality is a strong word in Scripture. And uh, someone uh, that's important to God usually gets overlooked when we're partial. And, and right now, we're at the last days. The work has got to be done. Amen? The gospel, the Bible says, has to be preached to all nations. And we can't withhold it, the gospel, from anybody especially if we don't like the way they act or we think they're too far gone to, uh, to receive the grace of God. Let me tell you something. If you, had, if you had any estimation of your sin and my sin, you would understand that God wants to save every man on the face of the earth. He does. That's his heart. Amen. 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 All right, we're going to read some scripture to you that is not in James, but we'll introduce you I think, to how God feels about partiality, so you will have no mixed opinion about how God feels about being partial. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Acts 10.34 says this, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Now, that might not strike you too, too much, but Peter was there the day the Gentiles began to get saved. I don't know about you, but that was good news for me because mm -hmm. I'm not a national Jew, all right? I, I'm a spiritual Jew, but I'm not a national Jew. And so, uh, the, the day, <laughs> this day, the day at the house of Cornelius, when the house of Cornelius got saved, Peter, said, Peter opened his mouth, and he did it in a great way, in a wise way. And he said, my goodness, we got Gentiles in the, in the room that got saved. Wow, God is not partial. He wants everybody to be saved. And he went to a people group that were basically despised by the Jews called the Gentiles. And uh, they were pagans. They, they needed God. They needed God just like the pagans in our world do today. But God, through his mercy, through his son, Jesus Christ, saved all men. And men began to be saved when the Holy Spirit was outpoured. All nations began to get saved. Praise God. So this was a great moment uh, in history. And Peter says, 
Out of all this, I perceive that God is not partial. Praise God. Romans 2.9 says this, Tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first, and also the Greek. Boy, they're getting more bold about this Jew and Greek thing here. Okay, so you're going to see it develop there. But uh, verse 10 says, But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. So let me tell you something, and I'm going to get to this at the end too, because I believe it's very, very important. A, 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 a Gentile or a Jew, whoever they are, if they sin, they're responsible for their own sin. There's some people walking around today that don't think that the Jews, or some Christians that don't think that the Jews are responsible for their sin, that God will overlook them because they are somehow or another a chosen people. That's not what the scripture says. That's not what it says. It says that God is going to judge. The, the soul that sins is the one that's going to die. Whether they're Jews, whether they're Greeks, uh, whether they're Italians, or uh, Czechoslovakians, it doesn't matter. Amen? And so uh, they had a false, the Jews especially had a false sanction on the, on the law called their tradition. And uh, their traditions got in their way a lot of the way that they looked at men. And uh, they looked down on a lot of people and they taught that it was okay to look down on people because of their traditions, because they were Gentiles, because they were pagans and so forth. And God was totally blowing this whole concept out of the water. Now why am I saying this? Because we live in the last days. And the Lord is watching us. The Lord's watching his bride. He wants a spotless bride. And so this is one of the things that we have to keep in the back of our mind that we're not doing. Uh, Ephesians 6, 9 says this, And your own master also in heaven is also in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. And it's interesting because he's writing to a group of people that are bosses or masters of slaves. He's writing to a, a group of people in Ephesus that had slaves and they had employees. And God was telling them to treat them right. And so God says, or Paul said that there's no partiality with God. So earthly masters, and if you, especially if you're in this room today and you're in charge of some people, amen? The Bible says, do not show partiality. Yes, they work for you, but they're human beings. Amen? Maybe somebody watching me by the video, uh, this is for you this morning. Amen? And take heed to what the Lord is saying. That you be kind to your employees and be good to your employees. Amen? I don't know who that was for, and it won't cost you any extra either. Okay. Uh, Colossians 3.25 says this, But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. And then it finishes up that chapter with whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Amen? So that if you're in a job or you're in any situation, be you a uh, teacher, I guess it's pick on teacher day today. Amen? Uh, whether you're a teacher or whoever you are, a pastor or whatever, you don't show partiality and you work for the Lord. Whether you, whatever profession you're in, Whatever uh, field you're in, you work for the Lord, not for men. And not either for their favor or for you getting an extra ounce of work out of them or whatever it might be. Amen? So we can get, we can get a little squirrely with, uh, with partiality and we don't even know it. Amen? And so God's, God's saying alert, alert, alert. Okay? So this was a slide from Gordon. Is, it, is that up? Yep, that's up on the screen. A couple of weeks ago. And I believe this applies. Because church, beloved, just like Gordon said, there's going to be some newbies, that was his word, newbies coming to church, new people coming in. And so the question is, what are we going to do with them? You know, they had a council in Jerusalem when, when the uh, Gentiles started to get saved. <laughs> the Jews had to have a council and say, what are we going to do with these Gentiles? They're overrunning the place. There's, more, there's almost more of them than there is of us. What do we? So they, they got together some things, guidelines for the Gentiles 
to help them in their walk with the Lord. And it's the same thing we're confronted with today. So God says, uh, and has shown us through the word of God, that there's going to be an influx of people that are going to come into the church. What are we going to do with them? And according to Gordon, Susan and I aren't going to be able to handle the whole lot of them. So th that's the question. We have to be sitting here in our seats saying, what's going to happen? What are we going to do when they come in, when the lost come in? Are we going to take care of them? Are we going to show them about salvation and water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and divine healing and all these things? You can read them. I'm not going to read them all and comment on them. Gordon already did that. And if you, don't, if you weren't here for that Sunday, you get the message and watch it. It's very, very important. But you see, partiality, we can be partial and not even know it by ignoring somebody. God, through his wisdom, is drawing all men unto himself. Isn't that what he said? Mm -hmm. I'll be lifted up. I'll draw all men into myself. And so if we want to be like God, if we want to be like Christ, what are we going to do when we see somebody new come into the church? Are we going to say, well, you know, Pastor Ed and Susan will follow up on them. Let's go to lunch. Goodbye. No. Are we going to take care of them? Good question, Gordon. Don't blame me. That was Gordon. <laughs> Got you, Gordon. All right. <laughs> so, and he called them newbies. And he spelled it in the Gordon Hofer, Hofer way, too, by the way, the newbies. Amen. Number one, so who belongs at the table of the Lord? Good question, right? Who belongs there? James chapter 2, verse 1, my brethren, he says. So who's he writing to again? <laughs> Believers, right? He's, he's concerned. He's wise. And he looks at the church, and he looks at... What's going on? What's being preached? What's being taught outside the church? And he's very concerned that people don't begin to show partiality because of the cheap grace that's being preached in the community. Amen? And that was his concern. There are a lot of writers that write that. He put that in some other writings and things like that. Uh, so he says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. I love when he puts that in there. The Lord of glory. When he says glory, that, that you can supply the word holy in there. He's a holy God. He doesn't sin. There is no darkness with the Lord. No darkness in him. The, uh, John said that in 1 John. No darkness with him. So the Lord does not hold. He says, do not hold. Notice what, how he says. He says, don't hold in one hand the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and hold in another hand partiality. You're picking and choosing who God puts in front of you and who you're going to talk to and who you're going to just speak the things of Christ to. He says, don't do that. Verse 2, For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings or fine apparel, and there should also come a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand there. He doesn't even, poor guy, doesn't even get a seat in that church. Amen. You, you, or sit here at my footstool. All right. Well, you can have, you can have my footstool. I'll move, I will move my feet and you can sit on my footstool. <laughs> All right. Have you not shown partiality amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Everybody's worthy of your time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everybody. Everybody's worthy of your attention. Everybody. And, and they may look pretty strange. <laughs> we live in a... Somebody put a, a, a picture up on, uh, on uh, Facebook yesterday of, of a beach scene in the 70s. And I, I'm telling you, in the 70s, and, and I thought it was bad in the 70s, but it was a total different world. Mm -hmm. you, you saw people, uh, they had no sunscreen on. They had no stamps on their body. They, uh, they all look to be kind of slim and trim and Healthy. in good shape. 
as before high fructose corn syrup, I guess. <laughs> Y'all ain't laughing at my jokes this morning. That's it, I'll leave. It's the okay. truth. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. Totally different world. Amen? They said there wasn't even, and I never thought about this, but there wasn't cup holders in the vehicles. There weren't. Mm -hmm. How did we drive? Without you know? And, and uh, I can remember a time when there were no seat belts. I maybe remember back then. Yeah. All right, going down memory lane here. All right, but you know, you look at a picture like that, and it could you can, you can just gets like like oh, what's this world coming to and everything. But I'm going to tell you something. Not everybody that looked like that picture is is going to be walking through this door. That's right. Yeah. They'll be looking a little different, quite a bit different than that. And that's what we have today. And so what are we going to do with what we have? That's the thing. And, and I'm going to tell you right now, God loves these people. He loves them. They, they are worthy of saving just like we were worthy of saving. Even though we're not worthy of saving. You know what I mean. Amen? So let, let's think about these things too as, as we go about. Amen? Our business. And we're rounding that fourth uh, corner and coming into the home stretch and we're going to finish come quickly lord come quickly well yeah but let's look around let's look around and see who's around us john 6 37 look this 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 should be our motto going into that fourth turn coming into the home stretch this should be our motto jesus said this all that the father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Amen. What a word. That is so awesome. The Lord says, whoever comes to me, I'm not going to say, I don't have time. Don't bother me. But he's going to drop everything and take care of his father's business. Don't you want to be that way? Mm, yeah. I so want to be that way. And, 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 and I know, I know right now that, you know, a lot of what I see, you know, would, would tend to try to stop me. And we're not going to do that, amen? Just like we're going to push everything over onto the count it all joy side. Well, we're going to push everything on the home stretch. But Jesus wants us to look and see uh, these little things, these little foxes that spoil the vine. Number two, who causes your oppression? That's a, that's a pretty interesting answer. James says this. He's a wise man. Remember, he says, listen, my beloved brethren. Again, he's talking to believers. All right? Has not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? That's a question mark. But you have dishonored the poor man. Do, do not the rich oppress you and drag you into courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? Amen? So he's saying, though I don't want you to show partiality to anybody, I don't want you to, to show an attraction to certain people or certain people groups because they have certain power and influence. Amen? And if you realize that's what the whole pagan system is about. It's about gaining advantage by Lucifer, Lucifer uh, leading the way, leading the charge. You will gain power and influence by the people you know and the people you associate with and the secret society that you belong to. And that's that whole system right now that God is coming back, sending Jesus back to destroy in Jesus' name. Amen. So partiality takes a little bit different light when you look at it that way. That that's what the enemy, the enemy's running his whole kingdom by partiality. Mm -hmm. that's right. He really is. Amen. So uh, Proverbs 22, 22. That's easy to remember, right? 22, 22. Uh, it says this, do not rob the poor because he's poor. Do not oppress the afflicted at the gate. And you notice this is attitude. Why would you rob a poor man except that you know he's poor and, and he probably has no will to, to fight you or whatever, right? So it's, it's very, this is very internal. This is an internal attitude 
that, that has to go in Jesus' name. Because why? It's an open door that the devil can get, get through in your life. He says, don't oppress the afflicted at the gate. And the first thing I thought of was the gate of the temple. Amen? Do not oppress people at the gate. I talked to a lady yesterday, and uh, she went to a, a church, and um, she had a little, little girl with her. Uh, and, of course, the child was born out of wedlock. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that's all she got in the, in the church was just criticized. And you know, she knows it was a sin. She knows it was wrong. And she's reaching out to the church. And you know, the church had some really, really harsh words for her. You know, we've got to, we've got to, you know, it may be a little out of our comfort zone, but we've got to be, we've got to be stronger than that. And the Lord can give you that power and that strength. Verse 23, for the Lord will plead their cause and plunder the soul of those who plunder them. Wow. <laughs> ouch. How many of you say God ouch to that one, huh? Yeah. Careful. We're not going to... Nah, nah, nah. They're off limits now. They're off... No, I'm not going <laughs> to... Not going to go there anymore. All right? I'm in the home stretch, but I'm going to pay attention to that. Amen? Because I want to make it. How about you? Amen. I want to make it. I want to do his bidding. I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So this is part of it. And number three. So who will be judged? And this is James uh, 2.8. He says, if you really fulfill the royal law. So the royal law is the law belonging to the king. And we know that God gave us his law. Right? We know that. Again, he's writing to believers. Remember that. Every time you hear... Uh, we're not under law, we're under grace. Well, no, we're not under law, but the law has something to do with, with us today. It really does. All right? The Ten Commandments uh, have not been uh, 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 expunged by Jesus. All right? He, he obeyed the Ten Commandments. We need to obey the Ten Commandments. So it says, the royal law, according to the scripture, which is Matthew twenty two thirty six, 36, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So that was the, right? That was the number two uh, law that uh, the Lord gave to uh, the young man that came to him. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. All right? So he didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. He came to fulfill them. And through him, we can fulfill them too. Amen? Amen. All right. So he says, you do well if you love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 9 says, but if you show partiality, you commit sin. There it is. So, you know, you can dance around the mulberry bush if you want to, but partiality is sin. Pure and simple. So if you show partiality, you commit sin, verse 9, and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. A transgressor. Notice it says convicted by the law. Who's he writing to? Believers. Believers. Wow. And, and how many times have we been told oh, so many different, you know, the law doesn't apply, yada, yada. It does. It does. And this is, I, I believe this is New Testament, right? This is an Old Testament. Okay. Um, so you just got to read the word. Read the word. Uh, verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law... <laughs> He's writing to believers again, and yet stumbles at one point. He is guilty of it all. Mm. Mm -mm. All right, now just let this speak for itself. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. All right, so you don't get to pick and choose. You know, which one of the Ten Commandments you follow, right? They're all, all for you and me, all right? Verse 12. So speak and do so as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy, and mercy triumphs over judgment. Praise God. So the, the, what I said in the beginning, that big word, the antinomian spirit, or... 
the abuse of grace. Grace is getting so abused today. Mm -hmm. And it is not going to fare well for people that abuse the grace of God. Can you spell that? I yep. research it. I have it down here. A N T I anti nomian. N O M I A N. Yeah, I guess I didn't put that in your notes, but antinomian, yeah. And study that. Go home and Google it, you'll see. Antinomianism. And how it was around in the early church. And how they just totally took the grace of God, which is the wonderful news uh, of salvation in Jesus Christ, and just totally made it a free-for-all. Made it, uh, you know, it made it okay to do any sin that you wanted to do. As long as you came back and, and, and confessed it. But the point was that before the fact, you were told you could do it. And that was wrong. That wasn't grace at all. Amen? And the Bible says in Titus 2.11, one of my favorite verses, what does Titus 2.11 say? The grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. So the grace of God does not set aside those things. Instead, the grace of God is a teacher that teaches you to say no to all ungodliness and worldly passion. That's being under grace. Praise God. Amen? Amen. We move on. Now, last point. Uh, I want to give you uh, just a little tutorial on partiality and the concept of national Israel, if I may. Because here's another way that the uh, church is going off into la-la land. One way they're going off is into cheap grace. Another is to go off and give more esteem to the Jews than the Lord wants us to give. Now, I esteem the Jews. I just don't give them uh, the esteem that the church has been perverted. Romans, I want you to go to Romans 11 with me. This is important that you know where this is. All right, Romans 11. And again, what are we studying here? The concept of Israel. The concept of Israel. And in Romans 11, 16, there's the word first fruits. I want you to understand when he's talking about first fruits, he means Israel. All right? So it says this For if the first fruits, Israel, is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. So what he's saying is we're, we're branches. Uh, the church is actually branched off of national Israel, okay? If in case you didn't know that, you know it now, okay? So we are the branches. And verse 17, And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree, what are we? Wild olive tree. Wild olive tree. Oh, us Gentiles, we're, we're a wild olive tree. Amen. That describes me before I got saved pretty good. I was a wild olive. I love olives, too. It's making me hungry for lunch. Anyway, uh, and, and these wild olive branches were grafted in among them, among national Israel. Oh, my goodness, what God has done. Amen? He has taken our branch and engrafted it into national Israel. Praise God. So, I know there's things going on in the back of your mind, but let's just read on for just a minute. All right? So he says, You were grafted in, and with them became a partner of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. The blessings, in other words, right? The blessings, the anointing. The anointing that was on uh, Elijah and the prophets is upon, oh, glory to God, upon the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. He says this, he says, verse 18, do not boast against the branches. In other words, they were boasting, they said, well, some in Israel were broken off and, and ejected in. And they were boasting about it. And they said, well, that must make us better than Israel. No. And he's going to show you why, okay? He says, but if you boast, remember that you do not support the root but the root supports you. Amen. 
All right? It's not because you are all that and a box of spaghetti, I like spaghetti, that, that, that you got grafted in. You got grafted in because of the mercy of God. Hallelujah. It's the same for Israel as it is for the church. You get grafted in because God, you've received the mercy of God offered by the Father, which is His Son, Jesus Christ. That's why Israel cannot get saved without Jesus Christ. Are you with me? So there's a lot of different doctrines floating out there, and I want you to understand. And some, I've heard you quote their names. All right? Just be careful what you hear them say. Verse 19. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. <laughs> well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. If you're in the kingdom of God, you're in it because of your faith. Because you've had faith in what Jesus Christ has done. So he says, do not be haughty. That's one of my favorite words. Haughty. I like to say it with a British accent. Don't be haughty now. Don't be naughty and don't be haughty. Okay? But fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. <laughs> Amen? Yeah, yeah. We, we cannot afford, we, we just can't afford to be, uh, you know, just have this idea that we're better than, you know, than national Israel, or we're worse than national Israel. It's, it's all a level playing field. All right? God's people need to know this. You know it now, and you need to teach them. All right, when you hear some of these crazy things uh, that, that happen, or, you know, that, that go on, that, that, you know, God will give Israel a pass because they're Israel. <laughs> no, he will forgive them of their sins and cleanse them from all unrighteousness if they repent of their sin and believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to finish with Galatians one, uh, excuse me, Galatians 6, 15. Uh, I believe it's important that we understand it. Amen? Uh, the, so we've got a couple of things going on in the church. Uh, number one, a lot of the church believes that the church replaces Israel. It's called replacement theology. It's pushed by dispensationalism. Uh, if you have a Schofield Bible, uh, you'll... you'll see dispensationalism uh, scoped out in the Schofield Bible. And uh, all you got to do is turn to Genesis 1 and you'll see dispensation 1 and so on and so forth. But they really push this that, that uh, national uh, the church replaces uh, Israel. And that's a, a whole new dispensation. The dispensation of the church. That's wrong. All right, The church does not replace Israel. We're equal with Israel. And number two, that Israel is more important than the church. The church also, a lot of the church believes that. And the truth of that, that is, that's the Hebrew Roots movement. That is how it, it's gone, you know, it's gone south like other movements. Mm -hmm. And uh, they believe Israel is more important than the church. That's not true either. Amen. God is no respecter of persons. Period. Galatians 6.15 says this, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. God doesn't give extra favor to the circumcised. He doesn't. You must be a new creation. And as many as walk according to the rule, according to this rule, Peace and mercy be upon them and upon, now look at these next few words, and upon the Israel of God. What is that first fruits, that lump that he was talking about, that trunk of the tree, uh, of the olive tree, the branches were broken off and put on where he's talking about the Israel of God. 
And if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you believe that He saved you from your sins, then you are the Israel of God. That's what He's saying here. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to look over and national... And I respect Israel. Lee knows. Lee's been to Israel and he knows how I, I feel about Israel and how they're becoming a nation and so on and so forth. I have the utmost respect uh, when Donald Trump put the embassy in Jerusalem, the capital, I was, my heart was warmed and I was excited. But believe me, beloved, we are in the same boat as Israel. And that's why we have to look at every man, whether it be Israel, Jews, or whoever, we have to look at them with absolutely no partiality in our heart. That the Lord has come to save all nations and all people groups. And we have to have our head on straight to navigate this last home stretch that we're on, beloved. And James wants to keep us right on track, right tracking up until the end. And with God's help, amen, you always need to say that. With God's help, we'll get there. Amen. 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 Amen.